Today's topic is understanding hyperreality. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to Way Pan. I'm Cal. I'm Sunny. What is hyperreality? It's this. For those of you who can't understand, yes, it is the most important piece of knowledge you could have as a hobbyist. Sunny, what are we going to be covering today? Understanding verisimilitude, the heroic scale and the psychological homunculus, basis and verisimilitude, terrain and scale, and lighting. Let's get started. What is verisimilitude? Verisimilitude is the feeling of reality, but not reality itself. One of the best examples of verisimilitude is not an example of it itself, but when it breaks. Superman's glasses. Sonny, could you explain that? Physical appearance-wise, Superman and Clark Kent don't look any different. But somehow, just putting on a pair of glasses makes everyone think that Clark Kent is not Superman. This is the breaking of the suspension of disbelief. This is where somebody can no longer accept Superman as a premise. It wasn't the flying, because what we saw when they were flying was the billowing of the cape, was how the wind responded, was how he punched through the clouds. It wasn't his super strength because we saw when he was using his strength, we saw the ground crack. We saw the strain in his face. We saw the feeling of reality, not reality itself. For centuries, artists have always used illusion to create the simulation of reality. With Bob Ross, you can see the way that he paints trees. He uses fan brush to create the illusion of many leaves on a tree, or the way he uses a palette knife to scrape paint downwards to create a sense of reflection in the water. Speaking of reflection, another really famous painting that uses a real Really great example of this is the girl with the pearl earring. At first glance, you think that the pearl is there, but if you take a closer look, the only thing that's painted is a blob of white and grey to create the illusion of a reflecting pearl. Everything else isn't actually painted. Almost all of art relies on one thing. Humans are pattern recognition machines. We are rationalizing beings, not rational. How does this make you a better miniature painter? Understand the lesson of Superman's glasses. Does it matter that you are painting an eight foot tall super soldier in powered armor in miniature? Not at all. The only thing you need to do is present the feeling of reality. What kind of base is he on? Is it snow? Why isn't the snow all the way up to his knees? What kind of weight does he carry? And with power armor, we have to show the power and weight of it by showing him sunken into the snow. That land on your miniature, it's not producing any light, but... You could show that there's light coming from it by creating a brighter area around the lantern. But these miniatures' proportions are all off. It doesn't matter that they're in a weird proportion. All it matters is, does the head look like a human head? What matters is... The, the feeling, feeling of, of reality, reality. Not reality itself. This is not a solid cage story. This is not reality. Not reality. Not reality. This is reality. Yeah, that's reality. <laughs> not reality. Not reality. Hyperreality. And the psychological homunculus. For those of you who are in the know, there is a particular scale to Warhammer miniatures known as the heroic scale. You might have noticed that the heads, hands, and feet tend to be larger than the typical proportions. Now, if verisimilitude, the feeling of reality, is so important, then why is this the case? This deranged and highly censored creature is how our brains perceive what the most important or most used body parts are. In other words, like it or not, this is how we see ourselves. Notice there might be some parallels between this and the heroic scale. It doesn't matter whether this was done on purpose or by accident. What you need to know is this. Heroic scale does not break that idea of verisimilitude. From a practical perspective, the reason that the models are sculpted this way is probably to make things easier for painters. Rather, your focus should be on making things look as intended. For example, making the materials look like what they are meant to be. Transforming plastic into fabric, metal, 
soul and skin. Your focus should be on making things real rather than how to hide the unreal. Your goal is to make it so that people can buy into that reality so that they can suspend their disbelief. People want to buy in. People want to believe. On to the next topic. Basing and verisimilitude. You're in a location. Draw a six foot or two meter radius around yourself. What can you show about your environment within this radius? Let's say that you're at the beach. What contextual clues tell someone that you are at the beach? Now look around yourself within the radius. There's nothing but sand. But on a base, just sand doesn't tell people exactly where you are. If you were to present the actual reality of yourself on a base as a miniature, it wouldn't tell people what they need to know. Are you on a beach or are you at the desert? What if we widen the radius? Now we can see the shoreline, some lapping waves and a bit of grass. This makes things a lot clearer. But if we were to give a comparative sized base, you would be on a 300 millimeter base if we used this radius. The lesson here is reality doesn't inform anything when it comes to a base. You need to have more contextual clues so that people know where you are. Just like the heroic scale, it isn't about the perfect simulation of reality, but rather the immersion within this reality. It's about making your audience feel clever for engaging with your piece. On to the next topic. Terrain, Terrain and scale. scale. Terrain is meant to represent the battleground at which the game takes place. So why is scale so important? You can immediately tell when a scale is off in a miniature war game. While there is a lot of similarity between 32mm scale and 28mm scale outside of that, the difference is immediate. If the scale of the terrain and the model does not match up, the immersion is immediately broken. While this might be just beating the same drum that we have been for the rest of the episode, there is an important thing to note when it comes to terrain. The techniques, skills and products you will need to use to create create terrain will need to be scale appropriate. Although this seems obvious, there are some cases where you might think that the size adjustment is not relevant. For example, water staining. Just add some droplets of water and you're done, right? Some slightly inked water could apply water stains with droplets. However, the moment that you put them on that scale, things look wrong. The moment that you put it on, you realize that you've thrown off the scale of the whole piece. We're going to beat that drum one more time. It's not about selling reality, but the feeling of reality. The idea of immersion. On to the next topic. Lighting. Lighting. The ability to see light is the most important evolutionary advantage that an animal could have. So many times it has been independently evolved by different creatures. Is it any surprise then that we pay special attention to lighting? There are concepts within lighting that we apply without knowing. Like for example, with miniature painting, skills like shading and highlighting are common skills to use that help express the scale of the model and sell the illusion. A common skill to use is underpainting. It helps to establish where the light source is coming from so that you know where to put the shadows and where to put the light. This seems very obvious, but once you start looking at things such as object source lighting, things become different. For example, with this model, the light source should only be coming from the fire. The rest of him should be pitch black. But why is it that the back of him seems to be emitting a blue light? To sell the illusion, to give the idea of verisimilitude. It informs the audience that he's out in the open in night. That's why the back is lit blue because of the blue light of the night sky and the moon and he's warming himself in front of the fire. This also helps to bring more attention to the lighting produced by the fire. Again, this is a great example of selling the feeling of reality. When you look at this piece, you can feel the cool night air on his back and the warm fire. If this artist was to show the actual reality, most of the model would look unfinished. However, it is important to remember when working with lighting, humans are especially perceptive. They will notice faults as quickly as they notice faults with faces. For example, if you paint your eyes to go in two different directions, the whole model could be perfect, but people only focus on the eyes. This too is the same with lighting. Most will recognize it as an uncanny feeling rather than being able to articulate it to you. Let's wrap up. 
Conclusion. Conclusion. Number one, hyperreality is verisimilitude. Verisimilitude is selling the feeling of reality, not reality itself. Number two, what is the lesson of the heroic scale and the homunculus? It's not about hiding what's unreal. It's about selling the reality. Three, what is the lesson of basing and verisimilitude? Having enough contextual clues so that we know exactly where the model is located. Because the reality wouldn't have told us that. Number four, scale and terrain. With terrain, it is the number one way to break the immersion if the scale doesn't match up. And remember those scale-specific techniques. And finally, lighting. Lighting informs a lot about where the model is located, especially the light source. If that is wrong, people will feel it immediately. But they may not be able to say why they feel that. All right, everybody, have a great week and keep, keep those, those brushes, brushes wet. wet. Bye bye. <laughs>